Scarves, the Renault RS01, which made its debut at British Grand Prix 77, it was more than just a great car arriving on the scene, or a great engine, more importantly. Mm. There were a whole lot of things that came with it as well, Michelin tyres being one. And also the V6 engine lent itself to the ground effect era, which hadn't arrived at that point, was mm. just on the, on the eve of the whole ground effect thing, unlike the Ferrari Flat 12, of course. So, that so Renault could then ride that ground effect wave over the next two or three years as well and, and work on the chassis and the aero. But your take on that engine? Oh, well, the engine really was you know, a great piece of um, innovation from Renault, but also a bit of opportunism, because they had this engine already, um, the Gordini Two V6. V6. Yeah, it was Cast iron brilliant. block uh, was raced in F2, one Le Mans um, as well in a turbocharged form. And then they had the opportunity, should we go to Formula One? There's every manufacturer has that thought. Mm -hmm. How would we do it? Would they go and build a V8 or a V12 or a what have you back mm -hmm. in the day? They had this V6. The regulations have been in place with the equivalence formula for a three litre engine or a one and a half. Since 1966. Since 66. And nobody had even thought about it. People yeah. had thought about superchargers in the past, but this really was the, uh, the, the first practical application of a turbocharger. Mm -hmm in um, sort of Formula One. Mm. And you know, the opportunity was there, they did it. And the, you know, this first engine, while maybe it wasn't the great success, it certainly was kind of the Formula Well, I, I was at that race, I remember, mm. and, it was, and it was a lovely looking team, the Renault Formula One team. Obviously, it was an offshoot of everything we'd seen mm. Renault and Gordini doing. Francois Castaing, um, mm -hmm. I went to see him in 74 at Very Chatillon, and uh, even then he was talking about, ah, oh, this will lead to Formula One. And the passion of the French mm. at that time was just brilliant. But much more importantly, it was all about let's get this in, get this car there. There was yes. no pressure to have to do every round of the championship. They didn't mm -hmm. have to run two cars. It was that golden period of Formula One when you could pick and choose the races. So they did Silverstone. Oh, what's the next race on the calendar that might suit our engine? Ah, oh, we'll do Monza as well. Mm -hmm. and, and they did Zandvoort and and you know the quick circuits. But they were never going to bother with Monaco or anything like that. And, and mm -hmm. that was a nice thing. It gave them a nice uh, step up. Yeah, it's obviously ladder straight away. very different days to today yeah, where you have to yeah. turn up with uh, you know two cars yeah. full season. And that really worked because this was very much you know early development. So it was, a, as I say, a cast mm. iron V6, 90 degree engine, had a single turbocharger. So you had quite long exhaust pipes leading back to the turbo, which sat low down behind the engine above the K -K -K, gearbox. KKK, I think they were. I seem to remember. Yeah, and yeah. A, a Hewland gearbox, which yeah. uh, again shows that they were focusing at this stage very much on the engine. Um, yeah. They did have um, a, an unusual inlet setup as well. So you had the tur single turbo behind the engine, and then the compressor then fed through the V of the engine to uh, an intercooler just behind the roll bar. That's right. Which is yeah. a really bad position to get <laughs> air into it. They had some ducting, it was both an air to air and a water to air, which they continued yeah. with for a few years. And then before going into the plenum, you can kind of see in the images. Really unusual. Doesn't make for a great engine in terms of drivability, and this was obviously the issue yeah. they had in the early days. They had lots of issues. So they had first of all the issue of drivability. You put your foot down, nothing. Yeah. The boost they built were terrible up, and then you would have uh, you know, more yeah. suddenly more horsepower than you know, all the Cosworth runners would have had at that time. And then because of this, you have great temperatures, great loads, great pressures inside the engine. So the reliability was was awful. And you know, it. it I think Ken Tyrrell was the person that gave it its uh, nickname. Uh, amongst the rest of the paddock, wasn't it? Yeah. Ken was never pleased about that equivalence. Once, once Renault started mm. to play with it, it was something that you could tell the Cosworth teams were going to start to yeah. think about seriously uh, as something maybe they should be fighting against. Mm. But the other point was how difficult it was for Michelin working with those engine characteristics. Mm -hmm. and, and But even the Dutch Grand Prix, I remember how quick Jabouille was on tight corners, and that just mm -hmm. showed how much Michelin grip there was. And actually in that race, Oddly, they did quite a lot of turbo development and they kept mm. trying to go to smaller turbos just to improve the That's throttle right. leg. That was their development program. Uh, and in that race, they retired, Jabouille retired the Dutch Grand Prix, not with a, any sort of engine failure, which would have been predictable, but with a suspension failure <laughs> because he, I remember he was using the curbs a lot. And mm. I guess uh, part of it was the Michelin thing as well. And, and he had this big lose at Tarzan or somewhere. And then he just went off and, and the rear suspension broke. Um, but then they found their way, and, and they did so as a group. And mm -hmm. Jabouille, we should never underplay the role of Jean-Pierre Jabouille. He was the only, was obviously the only car that year, mm -hmm. and he was very much, the mechanics looked up to him, the engineers looked mm -hmm. up to him. He wasn't a designer by any means, but he was certainly a very, very good driver, mm -hmm. engineer, and the feedback he gave the team was just invaluable. And obviously the legacy of that car was when they finally got it right, which was 
only until 79 when they went to a twin turbo that suddenly mm. gave still poor drivability but much better drivability and again reliability improved but still wasn't great everyone else then realized that you would have to jump on the turbo bandwagon in order to be competitive in yeah. formula one and that really defined the the 80s and of course the other point was how much influence the renault program with its turbo engine had on everyday motorists as well Exactly. Back in the uh, late 70s, turbochargers were used on you know, agricultural and uh, industrial machinery. It wasn't something considered that you would want in your road car, certainly not in your supercar. Renault started to be successful in Formula One, obviously mm. everyone else started to introduce turbos. Suddenly, during the 80s, every road car had a turbocharger. Even the humble Mini Metro was turbocharged at yeah. one stage. Formula Ford looked to go in turbocharged, I remember, at that time as well. Suddenly. You know, the influence of a manufacturer in Formula One was mm. being seen as a positive thing on the on the road car market, just as we have now. Initially, hybrids, no one liked hybrid. It was a very negative term for the greens and the, the snowflakes, what you want to call it. Now, supercars have hybrid systems and everyone wants hybrid on their car because it gives you performance for nothing. And there's that strange parallel coming back in with the manufacturers in Formula One and how they market what they're And to doing. take it full circle, so lucky, fortunate that Amade Gordini, who was the start of everything, mm -hmm. that that engine was a V6 and not a flat 12 or something that wouldn't have worked in that era of ground effect. Because it was a V6, it all just took off and the rest is history.